Open your Bibles back up to Genesis, uh, page 26 we'll be reading from. We'll be looking at Genesis chapter 31. As we carry on the story, Jacob has finished manipulating the sheep breeding to make sure that he got all the speckled and spotted sheep and Laban got all the plain and boring sheep, which are apparently worth more money, but I don't know anything about sheep. And we're now going to see what happens next in Jacob's story. So we'll start from verse 1 of chapter 31. Now Jacob had heard what Laban's sons were saying. Jacob has taken all that our father has built, this wealth, from what belongs to our father. And Jacob saw from Laban's face that his attitude towards him was not the same as before. The Lord said to him, Go back to the land of your fathers and to your family, and I will be with you. Jacob had Rachel and Leah called to the field where his flocks were. He said to them, I can see from your father's face that his attitude towards me is not the same as before, but the God of my father has been with me. You know that with all my strength I have served your father and that he has cheated me and changed my wages ten times, but God has not let him harm me. If he said, the spotted sheep will be your wages, then all the sheep were born spotted. If he said, the streaked sheep will be your wages, then the sheep were born streaked. God has taken away your father's herds and given them to me. When the flocks were breeding, I saw in a dream that the streaked, spotted, and speckled males were mating with the females. In that dream, the angel of God said to me, Jacob. I said, here I am. And he said, look up and see all the males are mating with the flocks are streaked, spotted, and speckled. For I have seen all that Laban has been doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you poured oil on the stone marker and made a solemn vow to me. Get up and leave this land and return to your native land. Then Rachel and Leah answered him, Do we have a portion or inheritance with our father's family? Are we not regarded by him as outsiders? For he has sold us and has certainly spent our purchase price. In fact, all the wealth that God has taken away from our father belongs to us and to our children. So do whatever God has said to you. So Jacob got up, put his children and wives on camels. He took all the livestock and possessions that he had acquired in Paddan Aram, and he drove his herds to the land of Canaan, to his father Isaac. When Laban had gone to shear his sheep, Rachel stole her father's household idols. And Jacob deceived Laban the Aramean, not telling him that he was fleeing, He fled with all his possessions, crossed the Euphrates, and headed for the hill country of Gilead. On the third day, Laban was told that Jacob had fled. So he took his relatives with him and pursued Jacob for seven days and overtook him in the hill country of Gilead. But God came to Laban the Aramean in a dream at night. Watch yourself, God warned him. Don't say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. When Laban overtook Jacob, Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country. Laban and his relatives had also pitched their tents in the hill country of Gilead. Laban said to Jacob, What have you done? Why have you deceived me and taken away my daughters like prisoners of war? Why did you secretly free from me, deceive me and not tell me? I would have sent you away with joy and singing, with tambourines and lyres. But you didn't even let me kiss my grandchildren and my daughters. You have acted foolishly. I could do you great harm. But last night, the God of your father said to me, Watch yourself. Don't say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. And now you have gone off because you long for your father's family. But why have you stolen my gods? Jacob answered, I was afraid, for I thought you would take your daughters from me by force. If you find your gods with anyone here, he will not live. Before our relatives, point out anything that is yours and take him. Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen the idols. So Laban went into Jacob's tent, Leah's tent, and the tent of the two concubines, but he found nothing. When he left Leah's tent, he went into Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken Laban's household gods and put them in the saddlebag of the camel, and she sat on them. Laban searched the whole tent but found nothing. 
She said to her father, Don't be angry with me, my lord, that I cannot stand up in your presence. I am having my period. So Lacob searched, but could not find the household idols. Then Jacob became incensed and brought charges against Laban. What is my crime, he said to Laban? What is my sin that you have pursued me? You have searched all my possessions. Have you found anything of yours? Put it here before my relatives and yours and let them decide between the two of us. This is the word of the Lord. We'll be, I'll be preaching on the whole chapter, so if you want to catch up on the rest of the story, feel free to read it when you get home, but I can't read all of that and then preach a sermon and still have a voice by the end of today. But as we start, let's pray that God will give us understanding into this interesting chapter of Jacob's life. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it has been preserved for our good and our benefit. And we pray that you will teach us by it, that you will conform us into the likeness of your Son, that you'll give us ears to hear, hearts to understand, and the will to put into practice all that you would have us learn from it today. Amen. So have you ever tried to fix a problem only to make everything worse. This usually happens with me when I try and do anything related to woodwork. I'll measure once, measure again to make sure, I'll make the cut and realise I've cut the wrong piece of wood, the wrong length, and that now nothing fits. So I'll adjust the plans, try again, realise that I've mucked it up a second time, and then give up and try and do something easy like cooking. Woodwork is not my skill. But at least my attempts at woodwork are not nearly as bad as Thomas Midgley Jr. He was faced with a problem. How do you fix engine knock in cars? This was in the early days. And he found a great solution. If we add lead to the petrol, the engine knock goes away. So he did. And then when trying to fix the problem of refrigeration at home, He thought CFCs would be a great idea. They work really well in fridges. And as we know, both of those two great ideas just made everything worse. Well, here in Genesis 31, we get to see what happens when Jacob and Rachel decide to take matters into their own hands. When they decide that there's a problem that they can fix. And we're forced to ask the question, can we still trust God to be faithful to his promises even when all we seem to do is make everything worse? So as we heard, Genesis 31 tells the tale of Jacob finally freeing himself from Laban's control. He's got his kids, he's got his wives, God has given him herds and blessings and wealth, but it's time to go back to his father's family. Time to face the music and confront Esau. And at the start, everything seems pretty simple. Laban's sons are getting a bit antsy that Jacob is accruing so much wealth. And so Jacob calls his family together and says, God's told me it's time to leave. Rachel and Leah say, we've got nothing left here. Laban spent all of our inheritance. Go. Do what God has said. Then in verse 7, we find out exactly why Jacob wants to leave. Jacob wants to leave because Laban has cheated me and changed my wages ten times. But God has not let him harm me. When he says ten times, he probably doesn't mean literally ten times, but probably something akin to how we use the phrase a dozen times. It means... Laban's changed his wages over and over and over again, and Jacob's getting pretty sick of it. But he makes a very important acknowledgement. God has not let him harm me. Jacob knows that God is looking after him. Jacob knows that the only reason he has this wealth, that he is as healthy and safe as he is, is because of God. God has promised to look after him. But then... Jacob decides to take matters into his own hands. He decides to do what he does best 
and he plays the deception card. Instead of approaching Laban and talking to him man to man, he waits till Laban's out shearing his sheep three days away. Then he packs his family up in secret and leaves. God has already protected him. God is with him. He knows it. And yet he still tries to do things his own way. And this just makes everything worse. Now Laban's mad. He didn't even get to say goodbye to his kids or grandkids. And so he chases after them, ready to do Jacob great harm. You see that in verse 22 and 23. Laban took his relatives with him and pursued Jacob for seven days. He was so mad he was willing to run for a week in order to catch up to Jacob and tell him exactly how he felt about him sneaking off in the night. Everything Jacob's done has just made everything worse. Until we get to verse 24. But God came to Laban the Aramean in a dream at night. Watch yourself, God warned him. Do not say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. God himself steps in and intervenes for Jacob. Jacob's done nothing but make the wrong choices, but God is determined to be faithful to his promises and steps in. Tells Laban, back off. Jacob is my chosen person. His family is my family. Do not touch him. And then we get to Rachel. We find out that Rachel is just as bad and deceptive as Jacob because she's gone and stolen the household gods of her father. We don't know exactly why Rachel decided to steal the household gods. There's a few good theories floating around. At least they probably would have been made of precious metals and had lots of nice, well, expensive stones carved into them. So she's probably hoping to sell them. And there's even some evidence that suggests that if you have the gods of a particular household, you are owed an inheritance with that household. So Rachel thinks that she's getting back what's hers. Laban has stolen her inheritance. She's going to steal it back. She's seen how God has provided for Jacob, that it's God himself who has given Jacob all the flocks that used to belong to Laban. But still, her fear at fleeing back to Jacob's homeland has left her to not trust God but to need to take her financial future in her own hands and steal these household gods. And unfortunately for her, it's just made everything worse. Jacob doesn't know that she's stolen the gods and so makes a rash promise. Laban, if you see anyone with your gods, he will die. Rachel's neck is now on the chopping block. And it's only her quick thinking and Laban's squeamishness that makes sure she survives. But by the end of the ordeal, we get this amazing verse in verse 42. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, the fear of Isaac had not been with me, certainly you would have sent me off empty-handed. But God has seen my affliction and my hard work and he has issued his verdict last night. The only reason Jacob and Rachel have gotten as far as they have is because of God's direct intervention in their lives. Every time they've taken matters into their own hands, they've made things worse. But God is determined to fulfill his promises to them despite their best efforts to undermine him. He continues to bless and look after them because he promised them they would. He promised Abraham and Isaac that he would. And so he will, no matter what Jacob and Rachel seem to think. God is there 
actively protecting them, and they are only saved from Laban by God's direct intervention. Fear and doubt led them to stop trusting God and his promises. But God's direct intervention meant that they were still safe, that God's promises would still be fulfilled. And as we read Genesis, if you remember from back all the way when we started reading Genesis, this is a family trait. Abraham, he lied to the Pharaoh of Egypt and said, no, Sarah's not my wife, she's my sister, and was only saved by the direct intervention of God in that situation. Sarah decided to take matters into her own hands and give her servant Hagar to Abraham to be a wife. And that didn't turn out well for them until God stepped in and made sure that his promises would be fulfilled. Isaac was just as bad as his dad Abraham and lied about his wife being his sister and was only saved when God stepped in and took control of the situation. Rebecca, like Isaac, tried to take matters into her own hands, got Jacob to deceive Isaac so that he would receive the blessing rather than Esau. And yet again, only made things worse. She never got to see her boy again while she was alive. And Jacob is only saved by the direct intervention of God in his life. By now, surely most of you can see where this is going. Because we aren't any better than this family. We constantly take matters into our own hands, think, no God, I know my way is better than yours. I know how I'm going to get into your kingdom. I now know how I'm going to live my best life. And more often than not, when we do that, we just make things worse when we decide that we know better than God about how sex and relationships should work, and then all we're left with is a past full of brokenness and hurt. When we think that we know better than God and think, no, I know how best to use my Sundays. I'm going to spend time with my friends, not with my church. And then all we're left with is a God who feels distant and a community that feels broken. All these times we take matters into our own hands and we are only saved from that thinking by God's direct intervention in our lives. <coughs> Unlike Jacob, it doesn't come in the form of a voice from God telling us what to do. It doesn't come as a dream. It comes as a man. God's direct intervention in our lives is him stepping off the throne, joining us in the dirt and muck of life as the man, Jesus Christ. Like us, like Jacob, he faced the same question. Will you trust God or will you try and do things your own way? And then in the garden, when he had the greatest opportunity to take matters into his own hands, to do things his own way, to save himself the pain and suffering that was to come, he prayed the prayer that no one before or since has ever been able to pray. Not my will, but yours. And because of the trust of Jesus, his trust that God would fulfill his promise to exalt him even through death, he was able to take the punishment we deserved to free us from our slavery to sin and the fear of death. That is God's direct intervention in our lives. That is why we know we can trust him because he has fulfilled his promise to us. He has brought us back into his family and said, 
doesn't matter how many times you make things worse. My son has died for you, and you are mine. Far too often we fall into the behavior of Jacob, Rachel, Abraham, Isaac. We take matters into our own hands and make things worse. But through God's direct intervention in our life, we can then say that God has still been faithful to his promises, even though everything we've done is try to undermine those promises. God will still be faithful, even when we are not. He will keep his promises. That means we don't need to earn our place in God's kingdom. We don't need to run ourselves ragged trying to do good deed after good deed to try and break in, because God has promised that we are already part of his people because of what Christ has done for us. We don't need to compromise on our faith in order to maintain relationships because God has promised to give us a family right here with his people in church. We don't need to run ourselves ragged trying to earn more and more and more money to support the lifestyle we would like to become accustomed to. God has promised that he will provide everything we need. These are the promises that God has given us, and he will be faithful even when we forget. But most of all, we no longer need to fear death because God has promised everlasting life with him to those who trust him. And that is a promise that can never be taken away. You don't need to worry that somehow all of your mistakes will exclude you from God's kingdom. God is doggedly determined to fulfill his promises to you. He used all the disciplining disappointment in Jacob's life to get him ready to be the father of the nation of Israel. And he can use all those mistakes, the ones you are most ashamed of, to shape you into the likeness of his son and get you ready for eternal life with him. God is determined to fulfill his promises no matter how many mistakes you make. You cannot be separated from those promises. It's not like one day you will do something and God will say, no, had enough, too many, I'm out. No, he will not give up on you. He will keep bringing you back, keep teaching you. I mean, look at Jacob. The man was a rat and a rascal, a deceiver and a thief. But God was still there, directly intervening in his life to fulfill his promises, to keep him safe, to bring him back to the land that he promised to give him. And so he does the same with us. He sends his son direct intervention in our lives, not because of anything good that we had done, but because of his grace and mercy towards us. And now he will keep intervening to make sure that he can fulfill all the promises that he has made for us, that he will help us to trust him more and more. So this week, when you go out into your work, into your home, into your leisure, you'll be faced with a choice. You'll be faced with many choices. Will you trust God or will you take matters into your own hands? When you're given the opportunity to mention God in a conversation or invite someone to church, you can trust that God will give you the words to say and will make sure that you don't embarrass yourself too much. When you're given the option to ignore God, to lapse into sin, you can trust that God's promise that his way is best. You don't need to take matters into your own hands. You can trust him. And when you're faced with the doubt that comes from sin, that says you are not good enough for God, 
you can trust his promise that says he has made us good enough because of what he has done for us in his son. We're not saved by our good works, achievements, but by the direct intervention of God in our lives. And that means we can trust him to fulfill every promise that he has made for us. Even when all we seem to do is make matters worse, he will be faithful when we are not. And we are freed from trying to do everything ourselves and open to allowing him to work in our lives so that like Jacob, we can say, God has declared his verdict. He has been with us. And it is only by his direct intervention that we can say, we are his. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this story, and we thank you for your faithfulness to us despite our faithlessness. And we pray that you will help us this week to continue to trust you, to not let fear overwhelm us, but to know that you are faithful despite anything that happens. Amen.